שלום. מי? יס. שלום. I have a question for you. For me. I don't have many answers, but I'm listening. Do you want to be healed? Who are you? We'll get to that later. But my question remains. Will you take me to the water? <laughs> Look, I'm having a really bad day. You've been having a bad day for a long time. So? Sir? I have no one to help me into the water when it's stirred up. And when I do get close, the others step down in front of me. And so... Look at me. Look at me. That's not what I asked. I'm not asking you about who's helping you or who's not helping. Or who's getting in your way? I'm asking about you. <laughs> I've tried. For a long time, I know. And you don't want false hope again, I understand. But this pool... It has nothing for you. It means nothing, and you know it. But you're still here. Why? I don't know. You don't need this pool. You only need me. So, do you want to be healed? So let's go. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Free to walk, like he said. Don't forget your bed. Why does this matter? Because you're not coming back here. That life is over. Everything changes now. Oh man, good morning, Revsi. How are you guys doing today? Oh, great. That's awesome. Hey, my name is Micah Barclay. I'm one of the pastors here at Rev City Church. I have the honor and the privilege of getting to share the word of God with you guys today. And I want to do something a little different. I know we just watched that powerful clip. I leaned over to my wife. I was just about to cry, and I've seen it so many times now. Um, I want everyone to stay in an attitude of receiving, okay? Uh, I want to read. I want to start today's message by reading the account of that miracle we just watched. It's in John Chapter 5, whether you're watching online or in here, I want you to really just think about what we just watched and what we're about to read. And this is the account starting in verse 1. 
Afterwards, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. It's a long time to be sick. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. Again, we just saw that, now we just read that. And I, I think I have read this story in my life at least a couple dozen times. I read through the New Testament quite often. And when I saw that for the first time um, in that, that clip, I, it, it just hit me in a, in a brand new way for seeing it on the screen like that. And if you guys are familiar, that's from a TV show called The Chosen. And obviously... It is not gospel, right? It's based, it's a, based on the gospel, but they add some extra dialogue. They keep the storyline going, all that stuff. That's fine. But whether we watched it or we just read it, I believe the message of the story is still the same. If you're lost, if you're broken, if you need a savior, Jesus was in the business of saving people then, and he's still in the business of saving people now. Amen? Amen. But we have to believe it. We have to receive what God has for us. And today, I believe God wants to ask that question to you and I. Do you want to get well? It's, it's a powerful question. We're going to talk about it here in a minute. But the title of today's message is Walking in Freedom. Obviously, this man received a physical healing that allowed him to walk, but I also believe he received a spiritual healing that allowed him to walk in ways that he never thought possible. But before we just dive into that particular scripture, I want to set the scene because this is really important that we understand what's going on. Now, we watched it and we just read it, but let's imagine here, Jesus walks into Jerusalem okay, for, uh, for a certain holy day, and he sees a man who has been sick for 30 years eight years. Guys, I mean, that is a long time. I have never been sick that long. I'm only 35, so I couldn't have been sick that long, right? But if you ask my wife, she will tell you I'm one of the worst sick people ever, right? I have stages of my sicknesses. The first stage is denial, and I will be like throwing up. I will be sick and achy, and Adrian's like, oh, I think you're sick. I'm like, I'm fine. Like, I just ate something wrong. I'll be okay. And it's not until, like, I'm literally about to pass out. And finally, when I am sick, I decide I'm very sick. And I shut the door in our room. And I just want to be left alone. I don't want anyone to touch me. I don't want anyone to talk to me. I just want to be left alone in my room. And if I'm sick for two days, she knows I just become a big baby. And I start saying, like, woe is me. And, I'm in, and you know, I can't believe I've been sick for two days. I'm a doer. I hate laying down, doing nothing. And so I just can't even imagine what this guy must have felt like for 38 years. Completely helpless to do anything for himself. I'm bad enough after two days. He put up with it for 38 years. Then Jesus comes and he asks the strangest question I feel like that's in the Bible. If it's not the strangest question, it has to be top five in my opinion. He comes to him and says, do you want to get well? If someone came to me and asked that question when I was sick, I would hope I'd have the faith to immediately say, yes, of course, if my wife came to me and said, oh, you're sick, like, Micah, would you like to get better? I would say, yes, yes, absolutely. But this man did not respond that way. And I began to pray and like, God, why, why is it? And I think there's lots of different reasons why, but this is something I really believe has happened to many of us is when we have battled something for so long, whether it's a physical ailment or maybe a mental disease or maybe just a spiritual condition, it almost becomes a part of us. It becomes part of our identity. We just think it is a part of our life. And I've seen it so many times. And it's, just, it's hard because when you go through for something for so long, inevitably, it just feels like a part of you. I know I've shared a little bit of her testimony here before, but I have a sister-in-law who uh, for a lot of her adult life just suffered from uh, sickness. And I didn't know her that well. She's the oldest. I married the youngest. And so I only got to meet her 
during like family time. She lives in Kansas City. But every time I saw her when we were dating and, and maybe when we first got married, she just kept getting more sick. And it just became a part of her story. And she went to doctors and more doctors. And they thought, well, maybe it's fibromyalgia. Maybe it's a mess. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's that. And eventually, like, it was just every time we saw her, it was just like, well, this is just, this is my life now. I'm always going to have migraines or I'm always going to feel weak and I remember when we had our first daughter and I don't think she had even, maybe even seen her yet. And we decided, oh, let's go up to Kansas City. We'll meet her for lunch. And so that way she can meet Matea. And so we drive up to Kansas City and she pulls up to this restaurant and all of a sudden she's in a wheelchair. And we go, oh my gosh, Hannah, like what happened? Were you like in an accident or something? She goes, no guys, like I am just so weak that I can maybe take 400 steps a day. That, that's about it. And then my legs just give out and I can't even walk anymore. And I just remember it, it broke our heart. And even though she was, she was a very, and she still is, she's a very faith-filled person. It, every time you talk to her, she would even say like, it really was just a part of her life. It was a part of her story. Well, fast forward several years and she was at a worship night at her church and um, the, the pastor came up in the middle of the service and just said, hey, we believe God wants to bring healing to people tonight. And she was like, I have faith. I really do have faith to be healed. And she goes up and gets prayer and nothing happens. Nothing happens at all. And so she's feeling disappointed. She drives home and she said, and her, her message is actually, her testimony is on YouTube, by the way. I could send it to anyone if you want to listen to it. She said she was laying down in her couch, didn't even have the strength to go upstairs in bed. And all of a sudden, the Lord encountered her just like the, the, Jesus came to this man. And, she, and he said, Hannah, do you believe I can heal you? She said, yes, I believe. He's like, do you want to get well? Are you ready to lay all this down? And she said, Lord, I'm afraid, but yes, I truly believe you can heal me. And in that moment, God's healing presence came down into that room, began to heal her, and she went to bed knowing she was healed. The next morning she woke up and she goes, I'm gonna have the faith that I can walk all the way to my mailbox. She walked all the way to her mailbox and came back. She said that was a, an accomplishment. The next day she walked all the way to her mailbox and to the end of the street, then came back. The next day she said, I'm gonna try to go to school because she's a teacher without my wheelchair and so on and so forth. Now she is a personal trainer. She runs 5Ks with her husband all the time and at least once or twice a year, she runs a race with our daughter. It was a miracle. It was a miracle, but God asked her that same question. Do you want to get healed? Do you want to get well? And she had to come to that realization. Hey, look, I've tried. I've done all these different things. But God, I know you are the only one who can bring me lasting healing. And today, as we look at this story, I want you guys to know Jesus is the only one to bring lasting healing in your life. Whether you're facing a physical ailment, maybe it's a marriage that's falling apart. Maybe it's a broken relationship with your mother or father, son or daughter, whatever the case, whatever you're going through. Jesus wants you to know he can and he will set people free if you believe in him. So I just wanna pray and then we're gonna look at this story a little more deeply here. But I believe this man had to overcome three lies, three lies that he believed about himself or other people that kept him from receiving the freedom that God had for him. So let's turn our hearts to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity right now. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be here. Come speak to us, God. Let these words not be mine. May they be yours. I pray even right now you would begin to reveal to our hearts things that we have just felt um, have been, they, they become a part of us, God. They become part of our identities. I pray that we would have the faith to lay those things down and answer the question that if you came to us today and said, do you want to get well? We could say with a resounding yes, God. I pray that blessing over every single person here and watching online today in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen, amen. All right, so three lies I believe this man had to overcome. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this first one down. The first lie this man believed was this. He believed the lie that says, I can't. I can't. In the show, he said, I can't. I've tried and nothing works. This is what John 5, 6 through 7 says. I'm going to read it a lot to you today. It says, when Jesus saw him, he knew he had been sick for a long time and asked, would you like to get well? Verse seven, I can't, sir, the sick man said. 
Think about this. The creator of the universe comes to this man and says, do you want to get well? And the first thing that comes out of his mind is, I, I can't. He, he's been sick for so long. It's not like, yes, I'd like to, but I just think it might be too hard. I, I, I would really like to get better, but I mean, I've been this way for 38 years. I don't even know who you are. And, and we, at the context of the story, he really didn't know who Jesus was, but we do. So we, have, we don't have that as an excuse, but he answers because he believes the lie that says, I can't do this. Uh, Pastor Thomas often, he has shared this analogy, this story that if you were in debt, let's say you were in debt millions and millions of dollars and for you that was an insurmountable. There's no way you were ever gonna pay off that debt. But let's say you had a a billionaire friend, multi-billionaire, okay? And he came up to you and said, Micah, I hear you're you're in debt, uh, you know, a couple million dollars, right? And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's impossible. I'll never be able to pay it off. He goes, well, I heard that, and I know this man really has the money. This guy, he's, he's filthy rich, right? And he comes up to me and goes, well, I heard that. Um, would you like to get out of debt? I don't think my first response would be, oh, I can't. <laughs> I can't. He knows I can't. He didn't even really offer anything, but you better believe I'd be hoping, like, you offering something to me today, right? Like, what are you offering here? This guy is so broken, so lost, so confused, and believes the lie that he can't, that he can't even answer the question with even an ounce of faith. But this is what the Lord says in Psalm 147, verse 3, says, God heals, or he heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. If you feel broken, God heals the brokenhearted and bandages every single wound, every single scar you've ever had, he will heal. Jeremiah 17, 14, I love this verse. It says, Lord, if you heal me, I will truly be healed. If you save me, I will truly be saved. My praises are for you alone. Think about what Jeremiah is saying here. He says, Lord, this is my faith. I know if you heal me, I will truly be healed because there's maybe some other things that could bring me temporary relief, but not true healing. He's like, if you save me, I know I will truly be saved because there might be some ways that we might feel safe for a moment, but only in Christ Jesus can we be truly saved. Why? Because he says, my praise is for you and you alone. And I would, uh, be, it would be a big miss without sharing, you know, probably one of the famous verses in the Bible about doing great things for the Lord, right? Philippians 4.13, for I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And that's a great verse. Um, we put it on mugs, we put it on our walls. I love it. Unfortunately, though, I think sometimes it might be a little overused or even abused because who knows, uh, who's ever prayed for something that's never happened in your life? Raise your hand. Okay, either the people aren't raising their hands, either you haven't prayed or you're lying, okay? Because if you prayed before, you've realized you have answered prayers that you just never had answered. And I realize that I can't take this verse out of context and say, well, I can just do all things. And if I jump off a cliff and think, Lord, I pray that you help me fly, I'm probably not gonna fly, right? So what is this verse actually talking about? To understand what this verse is saying, what the Apostle Paul is saying here, we have to read it in full context. And if you back up just a few verses before in verse 11, this is what it says. This is Philippians 4, 11 through 13. And it says this, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, not that I was ever in need for I have learned how to be content. I want everyone to say content. Content. Notice he does not say complacent, not that he's okay with everything going on in his life. He said, I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And this is what he's saying here. Okay, I hope you guys caught this. He doesn't say, I'm, I, I'm content. Not that I'm complacent, not that I'm just okay that I have a broken marriage or not that I'm okay that I might have this physical ailment, but I'm content knowing that God has the power. He's, he, can, he can do this, but I've been okay when I had a lot of money or when I had a little money, when I think things are going well or maybe when things are not going well before I know I can do all things through Christ who gives, gives me strength. He goes, this is the secret sauce. This is the secret to living a godly life. And this is what he says. It's learning to be content and live by faith that through Christ Jesus, dot, 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 
whatever you're facing, that you can do all things, but it's learning to be content that maybe this morning, and I truly believe the Lord wants to do some ministry today, Maybe you have a physical ailment. Maybe it's something that has bothered you for 38 years. It's learning to come this morning with faith to say, I truly believe God can heal me of this. But if it, even if he doesn't heal me on this side of eternity, I know eventually in heaven, I will be healed, right? It's learning to be content with that, but still having the faith to believe that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Even if it's something that has afflicted me most of my life or all of my life. And this is what this man believed. He just, he couldn't get over the fact. He's like, I just, I can't do this. I can't escape. I love to be healed. But Jesus came to him and said, would you like to get well? And he just believed the lie that says, I can't. What are some examples? I mean, there's so many, I can't give you an exhaustive list of things that could keep us bound. But in my experience, some of the most common things are things like unforgiveness, past hurts, past offenses, shame for the things that you've done, maybe shame for the things that have been done to you. There's, there's a myriad of things that could keep you feel lost and, and broken or separated from God. But we have to remember why Jesus came to earth. And if I ask you the question, why did Jesus come? I'm sure you guys are, you're all great churchgoers here and you're gonna say, Jesus came to save the lost, right? He came to die on a cross to forgive our sins. And yes, that is the reason why he came. But what, what did Jesus actually, in his words, why did he come? We can read that in Luke chapter four, verses 17 through 19. It says, the scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me, speaking of Jesus, to bring the good news to the poor. Now I have to pause. He says, I'm supposed to bring the good news to the poor. What, if I said, what's the good news? What would you say? Again, you would say that Jesus died on the cross and, and forgave us our sins. This is before Jesus' death and resurrection. So what good news is he preaching right now? He says, this is the very reason for which I came to bring good news to the poor. Keep reading. He says, he sent me to proclaim the captives will be released, that the blind will see, and that the oppressed will be set free and the time of the Lord's favor has come. That is the very essence. If you ask Jesus, why did he come? This is why he came. That captives would be released, that the blind would see, that the oppressed would be set free. Ultimately, he did that for us spiritually by dying on the cross for making a way that we could have eternal life with him. But this is so powerful. You guys have to understand this. He has purchased freedom for you today. We don't have to keep living this way. This man did not have to keep living this way, but he believed the lie that says, I can't, I can never change, this will never change. And it kept him bound for 38 years. That's a long time to be bound by that lie. I don't want anyone to be bound by that lie any longer. God does not want you to be bound by that lie. And he's asking you today, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? That's the first lie. It's the lie that says, I can't. Here's the second lie he says, here he believes in. He says, no one will help me. Okay, read it again. John chapter five, verses six through seven. When Jesus saw him, he knew he had been ill for a long time and asked, would you like to get well? I'm gonna keep asking that question today because I don't want you to hear my voice. I want God to be speaking that to you. Do you want to get well today? I can't, sir, the sick man said. That's the first lie. For I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. There's actually two lies that we're gonna look at in that sentence, but let's look at this first one. He believed no one would help him. Not only that, he believed that other people were the source of his problems. Did you guys catch that? It's, it's, it's even more profound when you watched it in the video. He blamed other people for his sickness. He said, I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles and someone else always gets there ahead of me. Have you guys ever felt like someone always gets there ahead of you? I know I have before, right? And you have all these friends and somehow they, they graduate before you. 
They get married before you. They get their first job before you. They have their first kid before you. They buy their first house before you. They get the first promotion before you. They get the recognition before you. And all of a sudden you're just left thinking, man, like who am I? What is going on? Why do all these people get all these other things and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm not getting it? It's bad enough when we compare ourselves to other people, but he went farther than that. He actually believed that other people were the source of his problems. And to understand that, we have to understand what the pool of Bethesda was. And we have a picture I wanna show you guys of what the pool of Bethesda actually would have looked like. Um, if we, we can put it up there whenever you have a, se a second. The pool of Bethesda literally means, or the house, I'm sorry, the word Bethesda means house of mercy or maybe house of grace, depending on the translation. This was discovered in the 1950s. I found this so interesting because up until this point, a lot of people believed that, uh, you know, it's like, oh, they used it as a way to disprove the Bible. They said, hey, we can find no archaeological evidence that says this place, these pools of Bethesda ever existed. This is why the Bible's wrong. Well, in, 19, in the 1950s, they found it and they confirmed it. This is actually the pool of Bethesda. And we can kind of see it in the video that we just watched. But just imagine different uh, of those places filled with water and all of these sick people, okay, laying around everywhere. We kind of saw and could imagine what it would have looked like. And, and this is what verse 3 says. This is so important. It says, crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on these porches all over here, okay? And if you were paying really close attention or if you were reading, this is verse 3. What's after verse 3? It is a trick question, so no, it is, right? You're gonna say it's verse four. But if you were reading up on the screen or if you were following along, you're gonna notice that most of our Bibles went straight to verse five. That verse four has been removed from most of our, the, new, the newest Bibles that are being printed today. There's several reasons for that. The, the biggest one that I found was in the oldest manuscripts of the copies of the New Testament, Verse four was not actually there. That they believed that it was added on in later manuscripts. And so some Bibles have it, some don't. I actually don't think it um, as, takes away anything from the story or from God's word. I do think it provides us a little more context. And this is what verse four says. So I wanna read verse three. It says, crowds of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed lay on the porches, and this is what verse four says, waiting for a certain movement of the water for an angel of the Lord came from time to time and stirred up the water. And the first person to step in after the water was stirred was healed of whatever disease they had. So this is, this is vitally important, okay? And I'm, and I'm not here to argue that again, maybe another reason is what does it mean for an angel to stir up the water? Some people thought or think it's an actual angel. Some other people think it was Jesus the spirit or something stirring up the water. Other people thought, hey, maybe it was just like air bubbles coming from the top. I don't know. We don't really know. I'm not even gonna pretend I know. But here's the thing that I do know. Enough sick people believed in the healing that they waited around this water, but they believed the first person to get into the water after it was stirred up would be healed. So what does that mean for our man here? That means for 38 years, he lost. 38 years at best, he came in second, probably worse. Can you imagine, honestly thinking about this for a moment, a place that was covered with sick and desperate people and they believe the first person to get in the water would be healed. Can you imagine the mad rush to try to get to that type of place, right? I mean, it's like all of a sudden the water moves and you have blind guys and they're going and, and lame men, they're, they're running and people are pulling and biting and doing all these things just to get into the water first, okay? And you can hear it in the man's voice when he's saying, it's like, man, these people, they keep getting in front of me. They keep getting there ahead of me and, and they're the reasons why I really, they can't be healed. And, and Jesus goes, no, no, no. Did you notice what question he did not ask? Jesus did not go to this man and say, oh, my poor boy. Oh, I'm so sorry. Who did this to you? Who's keeping you from being healed? I'm, I'm so sorry. Show him, show him to me so I can, I'll go beat him up right now. He didn't ask that question. He said, do you want to get well? 
And I understand all of us have had things happen in our life, things that are not fair. We've been abused and hurt. And whether you were abused as a child or a teenager or as an adult, it doesn't matter when or how. It just sucked. It's not fair. It's not fair. It's wrong. But Jesus is not concerned about those other people for you to receive healing. They have to receive their own healing in, in some shape or fashion from the Lord. He's asking you, do you want to be healed? And that has nothing to do with other people. That has everything to do with running to Christ. Colossians 2 verse 8 says, don't let anyone capture you. Say that word capture. capture. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. And I'll tell you one of the biggest philosophies and high sounding nonsense in this world today is the belief that other people are the, are the reasons for our problems. And we see it in the political realm. We see it at the workplace. We see it everywhere. There's a, there's a reason why you can't buy that. There's a reason why you can't have that is because someone else has mistreated you somehow in your past. And that's why, whether it's your boss, your family, a coworker, uh, uh, your mom or dad, the government, whoever, that's the reason why you're not happy. That's the reason. That is not the reason why you're not happy. That is not the reason that you're still bound up. God is asking us today, do you want to be healed. And that word capture literally means to hold captive. And there's this game that I play with my kids. We call it Teddy, where I pretend that they're my teddy bear. And I'm, I pick them up and I just hold them. And I hold them hard enough where, you know, it, they, they're not hurt, but there's no way they're going to get out. And I see some dads smiling in here because every dad loves to play this game. It's a great one to play when you're tired after church and you want to lay down. You're like, come here, let's play Teddy. And I lay down and I just hold them so I can lay down on the, the couch because I'm tired. And I hold them so tight and they, they, they fight. And sometimes they bite and they do all these things and I just will not let them go. They fight and fight and fight, but I, they are held firm. They cannot get out of my grips. And that's how so many of us live our lives. We let other things bound us and we fight and we pull and we try in our own strength to get out. And you know, all they have to do to get out of my grasp is to say, dad, I'm done fighting. I go, okay, you're free. And I let them go and all of a sudden they're free to walk. But how many years, how many decades have we held on to things because we've blamed other people? We can't blame other people for our problems. Let the enemy be the enemy. People are not the enemy. And let's focus on who can bring healing, which can only be Jesus Christ. He is the author, perfecter, and finisher of our faith. And only he is going to be the one to see us through. Amen. Don't let anyone capture you with that high sounding nonsense that it says other people are the source of our problems. Don't let anyone hold you captive to that any longer. This man believed the lie that no one would help him. Right now you're in a place where I'll tell you people are more than willing to help you. You're surrounded by brothers and sisters and friends and families that would be more than willing to step in right beside you and help you get through anything. But even we'll tell you, I can't bring healing to you. No one on staff can bring healing to you. We can only point you to the one who can bring healing to you. And that is Jesus. Don't buy into that lie. People are not against you. You have hundreds and thousands of people, saints of God who are cheering you on, ready to do whatever it takes to see you free today. Don't buy into that lie. And here's the third one, and, and, and it's, just, it's so real, it hurts sometime to believe it. But this man believed that he needed a pool to be healed. And I'm not talking about a physical pool here, right? I'm talking about turning to any substance, any person, anyone, anything other than God to find healing. Again, this is what it says in verse seven. I can't, sir, first lie, the sick man said, for I have no one, that's the second lie, to put me in the pool. This man was so focused on the pool, he missed who was right in front of him. He missed that the creator of the universe, the universe, the creator of his legs, the only one that could do a miraculous event in his life was right in front of him, but he kept focusing on the pool. So my question for you today is what's your pool? 
What's the thing that you run to seeking to find refuge, seeking, seeking to find rest for your souls and it only leaves you empty? I love how the story actually said it. He's like, well, you're still here after all this time. Why? And the man goes, I don't even know. I don't even know why I'm here, right? And how many times do we keep running to the same things again and again and again, thinking it's going to find, we're going to find relief or freedom, and at best we find a momentary lapse of relief, right? But we never really find freedom. So what are these 21st century pools that we run to? And believe me, we have plenty of pools that we run to. Plenty of places that we go to seeking rest and finding none. We can run to drugs. We can run to alcohol abuse. We can run to things like pornography, gambling, inappropriate relationships, the love of money, the love of self, if I can even be real, even excessive social media use, anything that we turn to to think that we're gonna find happiness by turning to those things. I was talking to uh, many people on staff as we went through our 21 days of prayer and fasting this year. I, um, I was praying a couple of weeks before that and I felt like the Lord, he just came to me and said, Micah, you're spending way too much time on your phone. And I was like, oh, like, God, I don't like, and if you guys know me or try to search for me, I've probably posted three things my entire life. I don't really do a lot of social media, but I do love my YouTube, okay, I'll admit, right? I can watch my hunting and, hunting and political videos as much as the next guy and uh, Facebook Marketplace. And the Lord is like, Micah, you're using this as a coping mechanism. And what I discovered was when I had a long day, when I was feeling a little tired, when the kids were kind of stressing me out, I would get on my phone and I would just be like, ah, I, I, I deserve this. I, I need to zone out for a little bit. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's a time and place to relax and watch a fun show or do whatever. But I mean, I was probably taking it to a bit of an extreme level and the Lord really convicted me of it. And I was like, okay, God, I'm laying it down. I'm not gonna turn this into a pool. I'm not gonna think this is the thing that's going to bring healing to me. And so I just deleted those apps and I wasn't gonna wait until like, oh, you know, I'll just wait until we do the prayer and fasting time. No, I stopped and for about a month and a half, I didn't have those on my phone at all. And my wife will tell you, I don't think the Lord spoke to me more clearly. I did not feel more closely to the Lord in those, that month and a half that I did in the last five years. I mean, I was just like, every time I read the Bible, it just came alive to me. And all of a sudden God was giving me words to share with people. And I was like, really all because I stopped running to this pool thinking it was gonna provide rest for my soul when all I had to do was calm down and run to the creator and he was gonna give me rest. And he goes like, that's all it takes. That's all it takes. But we have to realize we have to run to the right pool, which can only be Jesus Christ. Proverbs 18, verse 10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong fortress. The godly run to him and are safe. God is a strong and mighty fortress today. We will find refuge in no one else. Isaiah 45, verse 22 says, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God there is no other. There's no other name which we can be saved other than Jesus Christ. But here's the problem. When we focus on the pool or when we run to the pool, the pool always points back to the problem. And when we stay focused on the problem, it doesn't allow us to receive the promise that God has for us. And I wanna say that again, when we are so focused on running to the wrong pool, the pool will always point back to the problem because it's never gonna heal us in the first place. And when we have the problem right in our face, we'll never see the promise that God has right in front of our eyes. I, I wanna put up one more picture and then we're about to close here and we're gonna, I wanna do some ministry, but this is a picture of my truck and I love my truck. Um, but the real reason I wanted to show this picture is because of my sunglasses, okay? My, my sunglasses are amazing. They're the, the coolest sunglasses you've ever seen. The thing I love them about the, my glasses the most is that they are ginormous. I mean, they're way bigger than, I mean, like, look at that car in the background. My glasses are way bigger than that car. Why are you laughing? Someone said it. It's a matter of perspective, right? The glasses are right in front of the camera, so they look way bigger. We understand the car is actually a lot bigger than that, but this is what we do with our problems all the time. Let's pretend our problems are those glasses and God is the car. And when we 
run to the wrong pool, it puts the problem right in front of our face. And we go, oh my gosh, that, that, that problem is insurmountable and it makes our God so small. But all we have to do, church, is step back and realize, oh, our problem is nothing compared to God. It's nothing. All I would have to do is take those glasses off and if I put it side by side with the car, would it even be a comparison? No, if I put it right in front of the car and said drive over, would the car even be hurt? No. And yet when we run to the wrong pools, it keeps us focusing on the problem. And when the problem's right here, it fails. We fail to receive the promise that God really has for us. And today, I want you guys to know there is healing in this place. There is freedom in this place for anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. But we have to remember those three things. We can't buy into the lie that says, I can't. Because you can. You absolutely can. But we, we can't buy into the lie that says, no one's gonna help me. And other people are the source of the problems. No, that's just not true. I'm telling you right now, there's people in here that love you, will support you and help you as much as we possibly can lead you to the right pool, which only can be Jesus Christ. I would love everyone to stand to your feet this morning. And I just would love everyone to bow their heads and, and close their eyes and just do some business with the Lord and ask God this question, Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me? What areas in my life have I been bound in bondage for so long that it's become a part of me? It's almost become a part of your identity because it's been with you for so long. And today, the Lord wants you to be free of that. Whatever he's highlighting in your mind right now, God is asking you this question. Do you want to be healed? And without looking to your right or your left, to your neighbor or anything else, if there's something in your life that's going on right now and you realize, I want to be healed from this, I want you to raise your hand. Let's raise both hands and we're just gonna offer it up as an as a act of surrender to the Lord and say, hey, there's, my hands are raised. There's still things in my life that I just, sometimes I pick them back up and I'm like, I am tired of that. And here's the thing, I want you guys to know right now in Jesus' name that you can do this. God can break this because we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. So Father, I lift up every single person in here today with, that has arms outstretched towards you. God, I pray that that lie would be broken. They would not believe it any longer that we believe right now that you can do this, that we can do this through Christ who gives us strength. Lord, I pray that they would be content whether they receive the healing right now, Lord, and I pray for that right now in Jesus' name, that the broken relationship, the physical ailment, the spiritual condition, whatever it may be, would be healed. But God, even if you don't do it today, we know we will be healed for eternity one day. So God, we trust you. We will be content. We will not be complacent, but we will be content with what you have provided for us. For us, whether it's a lot or a little, we will be content because we have you. And Father, right now I pray for anyone who has this been bound up from what other people have done to them. God, we refuse to believe that lie any longer. They are not the source of our pain. You are the source of our freedom, God. And today we turn to you. We answer the question, do we want to get healed? Yes, with a resounding yes. And we will not look to the right or the left for people to bring healing in our lives. And finally, Lord, if we have turned to anything other than you to bring that healing in our lives, any substance, any person, and maybe there's obvious things, that, obvious things that we have turned to, but God, even if they're just good things that we have turned to, but they're not the best things, they're not you. God, I pray in Jesus' name that we would lay those things down and we would receive the healing that you have provided for us. If you wanna receive that healing today, let's give God a shout of praise and receive that healing for us right now. And then finally, we do not want to close today's service. Maybe you feel far from God. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. Maybe you, you're like, whoa, what is all this? That I didn't even realize uh, that we had a, a, a God in heaven who loved us that much that would come down and care about me. 
Jesus stopped his busy ministry on this earth to care for this one person. He would stop anything to care for you. And if you feel far from God, maybe you've never given your heart to Jesus, or maybe you have and you're, uh, you've stepped back and you really haven't been walking out to your faith and you, you're something the Bible describes as a prodigal son or daughter, today is the day of salvation, but you have to turn to him. The question for you today is, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be saved? And if that is you today and you want to start a brand new life with Jesus, I want you just to raise your hand boldly right now so I know who to pray for. Right now, do not delay to say, God, I need you. I need your forgiveness. I need your healing. I need you to forgive me of the sin that leaves me bound. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. All right, you can lower your hands. This is what Matthew 11, 28 through 30 says. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For those who just gave their life to Jesus, we're gonna pray this prayer and know that God's new burden for you, his new yoke for you is actually easy. It's going to be light compared to what you've been carrying for so long. And so whether you raise your hand or not, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. And we do this for a few reasons. One, we want to celebrate with the people who gave their life to Jesus this morning, but it also reminds us that we'll never graduate from grace, that we need to be reminded that we were once lost in need of a Savior, and we said yes to this question. So right where you're at, just repeat this after me and say, Father, I recognize my need for a Savior. And I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price I could never pay, to make a way that I might have a new life and a fresh start. I give you my life and I give you my trust. And because of the blood of Jesus, I will never be the same. Come on, let's praise God one more time for everyone who gave their hearts to the Lord. Worship team, would you lead us?